Excellent. Bit low? Ah, there we go. There's a mic. I'm so glad I polished my glasses this morning because I've been completely blinded by the lights at the moment. So hopefully I'll be able to, to see some of you as we, uh, as we go through. Um, we're going to spend some time together today. Um, and to begin, I want to invite you to think about what I think is a simple truth. That every interview that we do is actually the opportunity to make our industry a better place. And it makes me a bit sad, because I feel like all sorts of toxic norms have crept into tech hiring. Um, and so my hope today is that everybody can come away from this, uh, this session feeling like they actually have the opportunity to make the tech world a little bit better. I've been in tech for 20 years. Spoiler alert, I may not be young. Um, and I've spotted a number of patterns and over time been able to think about, well, what are the interventions that might be able to neutralize some of these patterns? Because what's interesting to me is that interviewing is probably a part of everybody's job these days. But my sense is very few people in this room have ever been trained actually in how to be a good interviewer. My sense is most of us learn how to interview by being interviewed, um, which is a little bit like thinking you could perform a root canal just because you once went to the dentist. Um, so my aim is that we'll spend some time thinking about what are the little things that we could do without having to get recruitment involved, without having to get HR involved, to make your interviewing process a little bit fairer, a little bit nicer, um, a little bit more empowering. Before I go kind of too much further, um, oh, I'll fall off the stage. <laughs> Didn't realize that was there. What a great start. Um, hello, I'm Susie. As you can see, I'm really short-sighted. I was actually at the, um, at the opera house yesterday, and that feels like it's completely designed to trip up people like me with kind of lots of marble and kind of glare. Um, I didn't expect that to happen today, so that's brilliant. Um, as I said before, I've spent a long time in tech. Um, I was the first ever global head of recruitment for a software consultancy called ThoughtWorks. I don't work for ThoughtWorks anymore. Um, I've now set up my own business called A Partner, um, which is the French word to belong. And the reason I decided to call my business a partner um, is because I think belonging is one of the parts of the conversation that's really missing in tech at the moment. Um, maybe it's because I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but I'm a little bit tired of organizations saying, we want to think about diversity hiring, because what I find is they do some diversity hiring, and then all of the people from underrepresented groups say, we really hate it here, we don't fit in, we're not having a lot of fun, and then the inclusivity work begins. So the reason I chose to call my business a partner to belong is because I actually think we can short circuit some of this stuff if we think about actually what does it mean to belong to an organization? What does it mean to belong to a team? Um, so we'll spend some time thinking about that today. I have interviewed literally thousands of technologists. Um, it's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, and I've certainly been on a journey to go from perhaps being a slightly sort of gnarly gatekeeper recruitment type, I'm going to keep people out, to the total hippie that I am today, um, who stands up in front of a room full of people talking about how kind of love and belonging um, can make the industry a better place. If you're on Twitter, I am too. Not at the moment, obviously. Um, but you can um, tweet at me, Susie Edwards. Um, and this is going to be ingrained on your retina by the end of this, uh, this talk. NDC, I'll slow the hashtag. Um, maybe we could continue to have a conversation afterwards. Um, obviously, if you like what I'm saying, join in. If you don't, just put your phone away now. Um, and no need to say anything. I love a quote. I love an inspirational quote. Um, and I really like this one from Anil Dash. Every industry, every sector of society is powered by technology today and is being transformed by the choices made by technologists. Hopefully that makes all of us feel important and powerful and like we have a place in the world. However, there's a problem. 
I think everybody now has their favorite examples, or perhaps its least favorite examples, um, of where tech goes wrong. So I'm sure you'll have your own. Um, but mine are Dr. Louise Selby. Uh, she goes to Pure Gyms, and she can never, ever, ever get her purse to let her in to the ladies' changing rooms. No idea why. Well, she found out why. Um, Pure Gyms had outsourced the development of their entry system, and whoever kind of built that part of the system decided that doctor was a male job title, and only um, if, if your title was doctor, you could only get into the male changing rooms. Poor Louise Selby. Or perhaps you are a Snapchat user. I'm not, I don't need a face filter or a flower crown, usually. Um, but recently, they launched um, an Asian face filter. We'll let the horror of that sink in for a moment. A group of people, not just one person, a group of people decided that a fun use of the app would be a filter that made you look more Asian. Needless to say, that filter was removed very quickly. Or perhaps you've all seen the video um, of a bunch of um, black guys trying to use an automated hand dryer, um, and it won't work because it was built um, to essentially only recognize white skin. So it's databases, it's apps, it's hardware. And in all of these instances, I'm willing to bet that the teams that built those were not made up of a particularly diverse bunch of people, particularly diverse set of viewpoints. Because the simple fact is, teams that reflect society build products that serve society. And these days, we're seeing so much tech that's built, let's not even get into discussion about AI, um, of where tech really is not serving the people that it's meant to serve. Next up, another inspirational quote for you. I really love Grayson Perry, not only because he is a kick-ass contemporary artist, but he is also completely unapologetic about who he is. Um, and he's really, really smart on the subject of toxic masculinity um, and how men are as affected by the patriarchy as women. He wrote a really great book, The, the Descent of Man, which is a quick read. If you get the opportunity, strongly recommend you read it. Um, and Grayson said, we live and breathe in a default male world. It's no wonder he succeeds, for much of our society operates on his terms. I really like this concept, default male, because it invites us to a worldview and a worldview within tech, that actually all of the archetypes within tech historically are default male. One of the reasons that I like talking about it as default male is that it moves the conversation away from straight white man or pale, stale and male or, or whatever kind of slightly combative words people are choosing um, to talk about the majority in tech. And the reason I'm so passionate about this um, is because I don't believe it's the work of the underrepresented to fight for a space and to change tech. I actually think, looking at the group, many of the people in this room have an amazing opportunity to be allies, to think about how could I help to change tech? How could I prevent the archetype being so dominant? Um, and, and to move us to a different conversation and perhaps a slightly different way of thinking about this. It's really easy when you're the archetype to think that what is good is what you are. And I have an example for you. Um, I can't decide if it's the best example or the worst example of this, um, but it's an example nevertheless, and then you can decide. Um, some time ago, I was replacing myself. I was moving to a different role, um, and we needed to, to find a replacement for me. And something kind of weird happened. Somebody applied, and they looked exactly like me, like really weird twin-type doppelganger scenario. 
Um, and at first it was kind of cute. Like, oh, she really looks like me. Um, and she sailed through the hiring process, and everybody loved her. Um, and then three months later, um, she was actually sacked. Um, and I'm, I'm slightly ashamed even to speak about this because it's probably my biggest ever hiring mistake um, was a group of us assuming that because this person literally physically looked like me, that they would be able to do the same job as me. Now, most hiring scenarios aren't quite that cut and dried. Um, and I give you that example almost as a, as a bad example. Um, but one of the first big hiring challenges that I kind of had to help ThoughtWorks UK solve was back in 2003 when our founder stood up and told us that we were a bunch of racist, sexist, bastards was the exact word he used, um, because ThoughtWorks UK was kind of really male and really European. Um, and we were immediately defensive. Well, we've hired people from Finland and we've hired people from Spain. And actually, because you're an American, you don't understand, but Finnish people and Spanish people are completely different the usual kind of um, defensiveness that people tend to throw up um, when they thought they'd been doing the right thing and, and they were kind of questioned on it. Um, and so it did. It made us think, well, what have we been doing wrong and, and what should we do differently? So in 2002, ThoughtWorks UK was 9% female. By 2004, ThoughtWorks UK was 28% female. Now, obviously, this is because I found the super secret stash of female developers. Um, actually, there's no super secret stash of female developers. I lied. Um, the reason we were able to change, um, we made a common um, error, actually, that I, that I think many businesses fall into. Um, in trying to change the demographic, um, the change wasn't really with developers. We hired a lot of amazing women in tech, but we didn't solve our number one problem, which was female technologists. However, what that change allowed us to do was build a platform to get used to having the conversations um, and really to put us in a position to make real kind of change and, and leaps and bounds over the following years. Because when I look back, that was probably the most woke group of technologists that I've ever worked with. Nobody in that company, nobody in that group thought that there was anything sexist, racist, discriminatory about what we were doing. We were hiring the best. We were hiring um, amazing open source committers and maintainers. We were hiring the, the best of the agile world, all of the early adopters, the book writers, the conference speakers. And what we didn't realize, because I think we were probably a bit, of a, a bit ahead of the curve in terms of the discussion around diversity in tech, um, was that actually we were really just hiring people who looked like ourselves. Um, and so I've come to call this mirror-based hiring. We get really used to when we think that we're good, um, we think that the other people who are going to be good will look just like us. Um, and we took the time to actually find a way to, to smash that mirror and to say, OK, actually, your GitHub profile perhaps isn't um, the best example of whether or not you're going to be a great developer here. I don't believe that I can tell you to stop doing something without suggesting that you start doing something else. Um, so in this desire to move away from mirror-based hiring, I'm going to suggest that you think about binoculars, really handy apparatus that give you the opportunity to take something that is currently quite far away from you and bring it close. They have amazing kind of depth of field. They're really great if you're um, on safari and want to see a lion. Um, but also, just as a useful metaphor, um, binoculars are a really great way for you to think about somebody that you're interviewing and somebody that you're potentially hiring and think about, well, they're at this distance to me at the moment. What can I do to bring them closer to myself? This is my attempt at a kind of pithy slogan. Um, it might need some work. Um, but um, I really want to talk about the halo effect for a minute. 
because over time, um, I've seen more and more people talking about unconscious bias and unconscious bias training. And I'd really love to do a quick show of hands. Um, anybody here done mandatory unconscious bias training in the workplace? No one? OK, that's interesting. When I, I did this talk in London, and there were like quite a lot of hands went up. Um, it's interesting to me, because I think unconscious bias um, is the sort of mot du jour in HR, um, and people seem to think that it's the silver bullet that's going to solve all of our hiring problems. Um, what's interesting is that the person who, the researcher, the, the psychologist who even coined the term unconscious bias, um, doesn't believe that mandatory unconscious bias training is going to help anybody. Um, and there is a real rising tide of evidence at the moment that actually unconscious bias training um, does more harm than good. Um, what does seem to work is defining a common standard, um, a set of shared expectations around interview behaviors and hiring behaviors. Um, because what's interesting to me is the worst bias of all is what's known as the halo effect. And that's the one where you meet somebody, and maybe they went to the same school as you, maybe they love the same automated deployment tool as you, um, maybe you both ran the London Marathon. Um, but actually, much more... Um, much more negativity, much worse things are enacted in hiring from people hiring people who look like themselves than from people not hiring people who don't look like themselves. So yeah, you can see my career in marketing uh, needs a little bit of help. But there's this idea that commonality, the moment you see a CV and you get excited about something on there, something that they have in common with you, um, that's the moment when you really need to call yourself into question, to hold yourself to a higher standard, and start to think about, am I really being fair here? How am I going to gather the evidence of whether or not this person actually could be a really great addition to our team? I tend to find that critical thinking flies out of the window the moment you find somebody that you have something in common with, because you both like one thing, you assume that you both like lots of other things as well. I warned you before that I'm a total hippie, um, so your mileage may vary um, on this one. And I also can feel a 1,000 HR managers bristling as I begin to talk about this. Um, I talk to companies, and they, they say things to me like, well, we've never hired anybody who didn't work out. Or recruiting leaders who tell me, we hire one in a hundred people. Neither of those things are something to be proud of. Because both of those things mean you're not taking any risk at all with the people that you're bringing in to your business. Now, I'm generalizing massively here, but in my experience, it's people earlier in their career who tend to be the most um, conservative about bringing other people in. Um, which often begs the question, how do you think we hired you um, if now we can no longer hire anybody who needs any kind of support and development? Um, but believe me, making one or two or three or four hiring mistakes and learning from them is a far, far better way to learn than rejecting 30 people who could have been great just because they didn't meet this kind of bar that you thought you had. So let's be bold about this. How do you really become so much more positive in your approach? Um, and you begin by having the default answer being yes. I remember I used to go into interviews and um, I'd be looking for what they'd done wrong. I'd be looking for the mistakes. I'd be looking for how maybe I could catch them out. Um, and one of the things that I learned quite quickly, actually, is that interviewing um, is just a lot more fun when you look for the good. Here's an experiment for you and, and a way to take it a step further as well. If you could make the future relationship 
explicit. If you were to stop talking about candidates and applicants and start to think about potential colleague, someone that's going to solve problems with you, someone that's going to pair with you, someone that you're probably going to be in the office with, sometimes on a deadline late at night. Um, I think that really changes the, um, the power dynamic in an interview. And it begins to give you a very, very different way of thinking. Um, I had the misfortune of, of building a hiring process that in 2014 was named as the toughest technology hiring process in the world. Um, it was apparently the second toughest hiring process in the world, um, beaten only by McKinsey. Um, and we very quickly had to issue a press release to say why ThoughtWorks was not over the moon to be the toughest place in the world to hire, um, to, to, to join. And there was a simple reason for that. When you're known as being a, a tough place to interview, people who want to have a tough interview apply to you. People who kind of want to win, people who want to prove that they're the best. Um, and what we were really worried about um, was that this award was going to see an increase in people that really kind of weren't right for us. Um, and because of that, we would start to see this kind of move back to a hiring process that was really binary, that's just about are they good enough or not, and one that wasn't about evaluating potential. Because our sense was that the people who were kind of really excited by a tough hiring process probably weren't going to be people that wanted to necessarily spend a huge amount of time with us. To add to that, um, in my career, I've generally tended to be the sort of de facto hiring manager. Um, and so one of the things that I've noticed is I, I have to fend off a lot of those questions about people um, before an interview. Um, people, you know, interviewers who assume that there's a gap on their CV, so, you know, were they in prison? Um, or why, why, this company's rubbish, I hate them, why are they working there? Um, and it's really interesting for me playing that role of a hiring manager to begin to see actually how much almost combativeness and negativity people take in to a conversation, into an interview. Um, so that's why I really sort of started to think about deliberately thinking about this change. Think about potential colleagues, don't think about candidates. But then, it struck me there's one other way that you could think about this. And I call it flipping the feedback. Um, very often, when I see feedback about a potential colleague, everything in there is about what's, what they need to change. So, well, if they learn this, then yeah. But they don't know this, so they can't come work here. Um, and over time, I've realized if we were to change the questions that we ask when we gather feedback, if we were deliberately to ask, what would we need to change organizationally for this person to be successful here? Once again, it begins to change the conversation. It actually begins to change the questions that you ask. It begins to change the evidence that you gather. Now, I accept you can't always change your step tech stack, I can never say that. You can't always change your tech stack. Um, you can't perhaps change the domain. You can't change the tools that you have chosen. However, I think if organizations were to position themselves a little bit differently, if teams were to think about what is their appetite for people to come in and learn from the people that are already there, we'd begin to see some quite different interview feedback outcomes. Everybody know Patty McCord? She's absolutely one of my hiring personally. Can you introduce me? <laughs> uh, she's one of my absolute um, hiring heroes. If you think about the team that they built at Netflix, um, they hired people to do things that had never been done before, and there's not many organizations that can say that. And they built such amazing talent density. Um, 
And I also love her because she's really straight talking. Um, so Patty says, what most people really mean when they say someone is a good fit culturally is that he or she is someone they'd like to have a beer with. Culture interviews are actually quite a new thing. As far as I can tell, they didn't really exist before about 2005. Um, and in 2005, there was an HBR article, um, which was about how um, organizations where people feel that they fit culturally and where people are happy at work are more successful. Now, I'm not sure that that is actually a mind-blowing um, piece of research or a mind blowing kind of nugget of information. People who are happy do better work and the companies are, are more successful. Um, but what it did was spark this sea change and suddenly every organization felt that they needed to interview for technical, um, for culture fit, not just technical fit. Um, so this isn't something that we've been doing for a very long time, but I still feel quite glad that there is a rising tide at the moment of people who well, agree with me, um, that perhaps this isn't the right way to go. And I would invite you, if your organization does culture fit interviews, if you have a designated part of your process that is about assessing somebody's culture fit, shut it down. Say no. Don't do it anymore. Because at best, culture fit interviews promote false harmony. And at worst, culture fit interviews perpetuate this mirror hiring of people who look and sound and do the same things as you do. There's been a, an interesting Twitter meme recently. Um, somebody pointed out that apparently what in the tech industry we call soft skills and every other industry is just known as being a human. Um, and I worry that um, we actually started, we started to use these culture fit interviews as a chance to kind of check out somebody's humanness. My sense is, well, if it's that important, shouldn't everybody be doing this as part of a hiring process? Why would there be just one interview where this is assessed? I also, and you know, I, I admit I do have other hobbies, um, but I do spend quite a lot of time looking at companies' hiring pages um, just to kind of you know, understand employer brand and see what everybody's up to. Um, and there aren't that many organizations who say anything about themselves that every organization doesn't say. Team player, collaborative. If your culture fit interview is really just assessing all of the things that every other company is talking about. Is that really giving your company a, a, a unique edge? Is it assessing anything different? Or are you really just asking questions to see whether or not somebody is the same as everybody else who's already there? So, the tide seems to be turning, and, and the phrase at the moment is culture ad over culture fit. Um, and I'm, I get really excited about this, actually. I'm really excited when I start to think about what are the questions that we could ask to understand if somebody's a culture ad. Um, and my mind starts to go to things like, how do this person's values align with our corporate values? We made a very deliberate decision at, at one point in ThoughtWorks history. We used to have what we called a culture fit interview, and we changed it to be a values interview. Because as a business, we had a really kind of carefully articulated set of values we thought really deeply about. And it was interesting, because we did end up in situations where we could clearly say, this person is a technical fit for the organization, but they are not a values fit. Um, now, you know, our values were, is willing to, wants to see the world through the eyes, through the oppressed, through the eyes of the oppressed and the invisible. And actually, as, you know, someone who gets quite used to, to giving feedback to people, it's, it's quite easy to say to somebody, look, you're amazing technically, but you just really don't agree with us on this. And, you know, yeah, they kind of get that. Um, it's really clear. 
because you're able to talk about company values and not kind of individual values. Other questions that can help you start to think about culture add? Well, how would this person add to our culture? How would they enrich it? Um, and then my absolute favorite, what perspective does this person bring to our business that we don't have at the moment? Imagine if everybody who interviewed started to answer those kind of questions, started to interview looking for that kind of evidence. How do you think very quickly we'd start to see a change in terms of the, the makeup and the diversity of teams? And we'd start to see the demographic of teams changing. One of the things that I worry about um, is that we're getting to a sort of diversity fatigue point at the moment, um, that actually there aren't any interventions that people feel really work, um, and it, you know, ultimately it's about where is the secret stash of female developers? Somebody please tell me. No, please tell me. Um, and I think Atlassian are doing really interesting work on this at the moment, and their, their state of diversity um, kind of paper recently, they, they talk very much about, well, what do we do about diversity fatigue? And so one, I think, really actionable thing to take is to stop thinking about um, representation across the whole organization. Let's stop hand-wringing and thinking about, well, how can we be 50-50 male, female? And let's start to think about individual teams. Because actually, when you think about all of the interesting research and all of the, um, all of the, the storytelling around the business case, for diversity, it's about unleashing innovation in teams. And I think one of the, the kind of big problems that we've had is that we've tended to approach diversity on an organizational corporate level. When actually, if you start to think about, well, what does this team need? How could we round out this team? How could we change this team? I think organizations will um, very quickly um, stop having this diversity fatigue, um, and will start to feel like they really are changing the demographic of the organization. There's a really great blog called, uh, well, it's not a blog, actually, it's a, it's a tool, which I, I don't use, so I'm not linked to them in any way, but um, interview.io. And their blog is really interesting. Um, I particularly like it because a lot of their stuff backs up kind of what I've learned in the wild with data. Um, and so it's quite nice when you stand up in front of a room full of people to talk about it. Um, but they've done an analysis of what makes a good interviewer. And one of the key things that came out was this idea of, let's see if we can be smart together. So they can't attribute it to anyone, so I won't attribute it to anyone. It's an unknown, clever person. Um, but what I love about this person is that they've realized, they've, they've been able to synthesize the act of work, the act of problem solving, the act of what we do, and find a way to mirror that in an interview. Let's see if we can be smart together. And it's another one of those kind of things that I think kind of changes the dynamic and allows us to think about interviewing. Um, in a different way. The other reason I really love this is that it means we can't have that, we don't have that false harmony thing going on. I think I'm going to start a girl band called False Harmony because I, I talk about it so much at the moment. I think we have this idea that in an interview, well, people will get on, oh, it was a good interview, I liked them. But I think part of the act of being smart together is that you will work out whether or not you can disagree you will work out whether or not your kind of points of divergence and convergence are enough to get over and to be able to do smart things together. Um, but if you're interested, here's the, here's the list of things that interview.io says um, the best interviewers all do. So the first one is preparation. The second one is lay out the structure of the interview at the beginning. The third one I've added, and it's preparation, again, because I felt it wasn't kind of on their list enough, um, but it's definitely preparation, again. Um, the fourth thing is have some time to settle, have a little bit of small talk, uh, which I'm quite a big fan of. Um, I actually start every interview with the same question, and I have done for about 12 years now. Um, and the reason I do this 
is it gives me, as the interviewer, some kind of time to settle in. It also means, because it turns out I am a total geek, um, that I have been able to build up an incredible data lake of answers to that question. And so as I'm interviewing, I'm able to then compare that person's answers. And when I'm not combing competitors' career sites, I like to think about the answers to this question. Um, and I like to think about, well, how do we group people and what are my kind of launching off points from that? And so one of my recommendations for you all is, is there a question that you could ask everybody? Maybe you have one already. Um, is there a way for you to begin kind of slicing the answers so that you can begin to categorize people and, and work out kind of where do you go next in the interview? But again, I mean, that still comes down to preparation, which is the first, third, and fifth most important thing to do as an interviewer. Um, the next thing is about question quality. And I'm slightly less sure about this one, because what you tend to find when you talk about question quality is that people then get a shared doc, and they put all of their questions in it. Um, while an interview is built up of a number of different questions, um, you can't just sew together the questions that you see other people asking. You can't just mine a shared doc for questions um, and think that you're going to be able to do a brilliant interview. But the next thing on the list I do think is really important, and it's this idea of start small and build up. And this is where question quality really comes in. Um, so the reports from all of these people who've interviewed on, on interview. .io. The best interviews are the ones where they problem solve and they start small, and then the problem set is widened and widened and widened and widened. And along the way, the interviewer nudges them and helps them to work out what the answer might be. Which I think is really important. Having once witnessed a colleague of mine interview with um, his questions written on a, on a post-it note, um, holding them up in, in front of his face. And when people answered, he would literally go <sighs> if he didn't think that the answer was the one that he was looking for. Um, but it turns out what great interviewers do is, is nudge and, and help people um, and give them hints to get to a different place. This quote is from 1987. And I think it stood the test of time, apart from the egregious use of he. Um, but it would be ludicrous to think of hiring a juggler without seeing him perform. That's just common sense. Um, back in the early days, actually, of, of Agile and XP, we talked much more about this idea of auditions rather than interviews, this opportunity for somebody to, to really kind of work through a problem and, and to work together. Um, but what I think this invites us to think about is, well, how do we give somebody the opportunity to show us what they can do, rather than trying to ferret out all of their failures and, and terrible kind of things? So I'm going to say step away from that whiteboard. Unless, obviously, your job involves putting people under quite a lot of pressure around a whiteboard, in which case, do that. Um, but I think we've, we've built up this kind of bizarre notion that whiteboarding interviews are a really great way to assess someone's competence. And actually, what I think the whiteboarding interview really is doing is, is giving people the opportunity to put somebody under pressure. I did a whole program of interview training um, in, in India, and I'd spent three hours with about 60 people, and I actually thought it was going quite well. Um, and we were learning, and, and we were getting towards the end. Somebody said, Susie, sorry, when are you going to teach us about the stress interview? I'm sorry, I, what's that? Like, well, you haven't taught us anything about how to put people under a huge amount of pressure yet. Well, you know, I would have hoped after three hours together you would realize that's not really kind of my way of doing things. Um, but they were desperate because they believed that the single most important thing that you would do as an interviewer, it's much cooler in this spot. I wish it stayed here. Hold on. Um, the, the most important thing you can do as an interviewer is put somebody under a huge amount of stress 
and see how they respond to it. Now, obviously, if you were interviewing them to be an air traffic controller, I could understand how that would be useful. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that useful to me. It's part of a tech hiring process. So we talked about values and culture. And I think it's important you've got something to take away with you today. Um, so here, for me, are my kind of starters, three starter questions for you to begin thinking about what is it that your team values? Um, what is it that you're hiring for? And what is it that okay, makes you a little bit different to the company down the road? Because I think the other downside of these binary, combative hiring processes is that people are forgetting candidates are in control. They have a lot of opportunity at the moment. And I would be willing to bet that the best interview that any of you has ever had is not one where you came away feeling kind of put under pressure and belittled and like it was really, really tough. I would imagine that the best interview you ever had was one where you came out of it feeling smart. You came out of it feeling valued. You came out of it, dare I say it, like you learned something. And so if you're going to begin to make a change within your team, within your company, if you think about what makes your team different, what's unique, and believe me, what's unique about your company, that's the really, really hard one. Um, I was doing a piece of work to completely overhaul um, the Footworks employer brand, um, and all of us marketing types had kind of come up with what we thought was unique, and all the recruiters had come up with what we thought was unique. Um, and then actually we did some user testing with um, some, some of our colleagues. Um, and all of the stuff that we thought was unique got kind of taken away and removed um, and replaced with things that we would never, ever have thought of. Um, ThoughtWorks has a, um, a mailing list software dev. And it turned out like ev everybody was just so excited about this, um, this access to the brain's trust and a way to communicate. And yeah, we would never, ever have thought that that was something that was unique about our business. But it turns out when you ask people what's unique, they will tell you. Um, what are the things that are... Um, you haven't seen anywhere else. Um, and then also, what are your core behaviors? And I like to get to this one by asking, when was the last time you, do, you, you saw somebody do something that was very, insert your company name? Um, and as you think about that, you'll start to just understand these little kind of micro behaviors often. They're not huge things, um, but just the little things that are really kind of your team. Um, and then obviously, you can turn that into great interview question fodder. Obviously, I've mentioned um, being prepared quite a few times, um, so it'll come as no surprise that this is up here for me. Um, but structured interviews over winging it. I, so often people tell me, well, I don't have time to prepare because I need an hour for the interview, and so I, like, I, don't ha I, I only have an hour to give for this. I don't remember ever reading that an interview had to be an hour long. Um, if you only have an hour, then take 15 minutes at the start and think through what your questions are going to be, what the journey, interview journey that you're going to go on with that person is, um, and just spend 45 minutes with them. Because the best interviews are the ones that build. The best interviews are the ones that happen when people aren't a sweaty mess panicking. You know, just as they walked in, who's going to be good cop? Who's going to be bad cop? Don't ever do that either. Um, but it's really important to think about how you do this. I have no idea what that small flag on the bottom is, but we'll move on. Um, and so I thought about it, and I like a diagram. What I tend to find is that most interviews are like laving. So if you imagine a three interview process. Most of the time, all of the interviews kind of retread the same ground. And what you discover is the same 10, 20% of somebody's knowledge. Um, I think we've all been the candidate in that hiring process, the one where we told the same story three times, because no one really asked us anything that got beyond the surface. Um, 
And so I'm a big proponent of structured interview or drilling, because actually what it does is gives us the ability to get beyond the pre-prepared anecdotes, to get beyond the answers that they always give, and really get down to the sort of 80 or 90 percent even of somebody's um, knowledge. Because the other thing that this gives you, this being really deliberate about what is the purpose of this interview and what are we going to assess in it, is that you can begin to assess learnability over accrued knowledge. So many hiring processes are about understanding what has somebody done and not what could somebody do. And the only way that you can really begin to get to this is by making that change and deliberately thinking about what you are going to assess. I believe that careers are made up of experiences. And all too often, I see people getting really hung up on five years' experience of doing this or 10 years' experience of doing that. And actually, when you unpick it, you often find that they've done the same thing over and over and over again. And so really, they have one year experience. They've just had that year of experience 10 times. What switching to thinking about learnability gives you, or teachability, whichever one you, you fancy. I, just, I tend to assume that not everybody can teach, but kind of the, the people that we want to have in our teams can learn, so that's the, the reason for that. Um, let's move away from all of these hiring processes that just assess what you already know and start to think about, well, what could you learn? It will come as no surprise, having spent a long time at ThoughtWorks, that I am a big fan of pairing. Um, I've also got shares in a post-it note factory. Um, but I, I actually really believe that this is the way to do I will not go into an interview by myself now. And I think it's really important, actually, for any... Um, the more senior people, CTOs, VPs of engineering, and um, this idea that like, you're important enough that you would interview somebody by yourself. Like, this is actually an amazing teachable moment for you. You should never go into the interview room without somebody there who's going to be able to, to learn from you, to watch you. Because the best way to learn how to interview is to interview. And the pairing, um, the pairing metaphor, this kind of driver and navigator, I actually think works really, really well in interviews. Um, it gives you the opportunity to show potential colleagues all, you know, more of the people in your organization. And I think it can often really switch up the dynamic in the interview room as well. I was pairing um, with a colleague of mine once, and, and it was a tough interview. We were, um, were interviewing a, a tester, and it just felt like we were getting these really kind of by-the-book answers. She didn't want to say anything wrong. I think she, you know, she really wanted the job. Um, and it just really wasn't going anywhere. So I, I looked at my pair and I said, when was the last time you got angry? And he said, oh, well, there was that preacher. This was, this was in the States probably about six years ago. He was like, when that preacher said that like, all the people in Haiti deserved the earthquake, um, he was like, that made me so angry. I was like, all oh, right. And at which point the candidate chimed and said, no, he was right. And we had this kind of real moment of we'd almost kind of broken the fourth wall of the interview by talking to one another, by actually kind of asking each other questions. Suddenly, it, it, it really switched the, the power. Um, and the candidate who had been just trotting out you know, all of her pre-prepared interview answers, suddenly there was this spark. Um, it was a really hateful, horrible spark. Um, and, and we ended the interview quite quickly after it. Um, but we would never, ever, ever have uncovered that if we hadn't been in a pairing situation um, and if we hadn't kind of thought, yeah, this, is, you know, this isn't working. How, how are we going to make this better? So I'm a, I'm a big fan. If you're not pairing now, look, I know it's two people doing the job of one. Um, but actually, I think your, your ability to, to really get to the 80%, 90% of somebody to assess the learnability is just magnified so hugely when you're pairing in interviews. I, yeah, I can't stress it highly enough. Um, right. I actually have a whole other kind of 
talk on, on interview questions and styles, but I, I thought I'd put this one in at the end, um, partially because I think very often interviews are just sewn up of individual questions, and they're not something that we really kind of think about. Um, so the ones in orange are the ones that I like, the ones in purple are the ones that I'm a bit more kind of questionable about. Um, but credentialising questions, you know, look, they're really great for assessing knowledge. They're really great for, you know, beginning um, to understand the scope of the problem that you're going to solve with somebody and really beginning to understand a little bit about what they know now. Competency questions. Um, this idea that, you know, your, your sort of past behaviour is the best predictor of future behaviour. Tell me the last time you, tell me when you. Um, that, to me, is the sort of real meat of your interview. And if you're not doing it now, you know, really sort of switch to, to just getting people to tell you about the times that, that they've worked on things. But make sure that you always close it off at the end. Um, I think sometimes people think that competency questions are just kind of boring things that HR people like. Um, and that's not how interviewing happens in the real world. Where's my whiteboard? Um, you have to close it off. And, and the, the way to close it is by saying, and what did you learn or what would you do differently? next time. The reason I, I have hypothetical and opinion in here, um, I've watched whole interviews and somebody's come back at the end and they've told me, this person has done this, this person can do that, this person can't do this. But actually every single question that they've asked was either an opinion question or a hypothetical question and they've gathered zero evidence at all. Opinion questions and hypothetical questions are great ways of understanding what someone's perfect self is um, and what they would do in an ideal scenario. They tell you absolutely nothing about what they have done and what they could learn. So when you're thinking, and that's not to say you wouldn't use them, because actually I think as, as humans, as herd animals, we're hardwired. Well, what do you think about this? Um, but just become more kind of self-reflective, more metacognitive, actually, about the style and type of questions that you're asking in an interview. And just make sure that opinions, hypothetical questions, they're a seasoning. They're not you know, the, the majority of what you're going to have on your plate. I'm getting to time, and I, I think sometimes there's questions. So I'll, I'll recap with this. So this is the, these are the... Um, these are the changes that I suggest you make. And actually, this is not the same as the Agile Manifesto because, to be honest, the ones on the right, I'm not saying there's value in them. I'm saying these are the behaviors that you have today, and these are the behaviors that I think, as, as an industry, we need to think about changing. Um, and there's one at the end here that I, I haven't talked about yet. Um, it's a bit like the rising tide of culture ad. Um, compassion over condescension. I think, I think our tech industry is at a tipping point at the moment. There's so much of the, the discussion about um, GitHub. I was a bit worried, actually, that no one was going to come today, because I know that the most endorsed man on Stack Overflow um, is speaking in another room at the moment. So I said, oh, well, everybody will go and listen to him, won't they? won't come and listen to me. Um, but I think there's, there's so much discussion at the moment about, well, how do we make tech more welcoming? Um, how do we make this? Um, a feel-good place. And so the bit that I think the industry is coming to at the moment, and I welcome you to, to think about this for yourselves, is actually how do you begin to introduce some more compassion into your interviewing um, and perhaps kind of move away from the negativity, the combativeness, the condescension that I think sometimes is the sort of cynical, snarky, default way that we communicate in tech. So there we have it. Um, I'm Susie Edwards. This is NDC Oslo. My email address is there, susie at apartenir.io. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, gap for applause. <laughs> <laughs> Standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, please, please sit down. Um, has anybody got any questions? <laughs> and you were on your phone during part of that. <laughs> any questions?
Um, you know, you're, you're not wrong. Um, but I think the important thing when you begin to kind of break down your hiring process and think about, well, actually, what do we want to assess? Um, I find that quite often, if you start with a blank piece of paper rather than what you do today and rebuild it from scratch, you end up with something very different. So I would suggest that rather than thinking, well, this is another thing that we have to add, um, another hour of interviewing that we have to do, um, rip it up, rip up what you do now and think about, um, if I were rebuilding my perfect process from scratch today, what would I assess? <laughs> I've got two more questions. Maybe we'll come back and, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that is, so that is where the, the medium and the message are kind of being mixed up. So to me, um, I've had great success using um, kind of role-playing type business cases where you are deliberately, um, you're thinking about hints and nudges. It's a bit like improv, really. Um, it's very easy for a negative interviewer to go into a business case thing saying, oh, I'm going to be the dick, I'm going to say no to everything, I'm going to make this person sweat. Actually, that isn't really how the world works. Um, so to me, I say yes, use business cases, but use them with compassion in mind rather than condescension and aggression. Um, I do think it's hard enough to get people to be a good interviewer and to go in and to, and to be themselves. You know, you're quite vulnerable asking somebody questions. To go in and, and, and just be themselves and interview, I actually think you're bringing an extra level of complexity when you're then asking them to role play. So the other thing that I would think about is, is there a way to do a case study in a way that doesn't require people to pretend, pretend to be people that they aren't um, and to be smart together and solve a problem. That, that's my, yeah, my five minute on stage <laughs> answer. Yeah. Do you ever happen to you that you invite some engineer or some developer to the interview and uh, the person starts to show off? I mean, it's pretty uncomfortable to calm down your colleague. Like, I mean, are there any other better ways to do it? Um, I mean, when something like that happens, I just always, I question, well, what's driving this behavior? Like, what, why is somebody doing this? Why is this an opportunity for them to, to act out? And I would assume, like, you know, when you see behavior like that, you would say something about it. So the first time somebody does it, on, you know, it's beholden on the more senior person to say, hey, um, that's not how we interview <laughs> around here, um, and, and to nip it in the bud, really. Um, probably not in front of the candidate, not in front of the candidate, yeah. Um, this is why I, I would do think we send people into interviews like hopelessly unprepared. Like this, I, I think people act out when they feel insecure. And so that person acting out in an interview, they're not doing it, you know, because they, I think, because they want to show up the candidate. They, they want probably the person that they're pairing with to notice them and to see how smart they are. So it's, it's an unmet need, um, which is probably met by having perhaps a, um, you know, I talked about this set of shared expectations for interviewing, which I'm a big fan of over mandatory unconscious bias training. Um, but even as a, as a team, you know, maybe you could do a brown bag lunch session, which is, the, you know, these are the rules of the road in the interview room. And somebody isn't going to go in an interview unless they've read that. And then when they begin behaving like that, you, you know, you could politely remind them, hey, I'm just making this stuff up as I go along, to be honest. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> Like, I got the opinion, like, the impression in the beginning that 
that you, you look for a more broader fit than just for the specific role? Is that, is that the case? Um, yeah, I think, I think you should. To me, I think it's rare that there is a specific set of kind of cultural identifiers for one team that aren't kind of spread across the whole organization. I think, I mean, like when you, when you hire for something very technical, you look like 90% technical, then the others are not important. But maybe, like, do you, you specify a lot about the culture and the values? Do you, do you think that's more important that the, the, the person will be happy in that role and will be socially compatible with the team? It's more important than the actual technical skill? Well, I'm not sure that... So it's certainly not as simple as values and culture just being about socially compatible. Um, and this is where I think people, people do the minimum kind of easy stuff when it comes to thinking about culture fit. Um, if you think about a technical role, there will be the interactions that you have with your team. Um, there will be discussions around kind of... <laughs> technology choice and like you know how, how do we solve problems and so I, I think it's actually oversimplistic to think that tech is 90% and it's it's as cold hard and calculating as we think it is I actually think tech stuff is um, is far broader than just you know how do they pair or you know what they're like Vim or Emacs. I, like, I, I think we underestimate what a social thing technology is and coding is. And for a long time, we have overemphasized the pure tech um, and that we're at a point now where we're actually beginning to realize that a lot of this technical stuff is really human and it's, it's about communication. So I, I, I would I'd probably counter 90% tech, 10% cultural with it's never 90% tech. So I feel like people are kind of coming in the back and that maybe the next speaker might be kind of here. So oh, someone says no. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm here if anybody wants to talk. Um, I'm also really hot, so I'd quite like to get off the stage. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And um, please, yeah, hit me up on Twitter. <laughs>